Okay, um, Christine has given me uh, Mission Impossible. Uh, she uh, indicates I'm supposed to speak uh, inspirationally. While people normally, well, after they hear me, they, they, uh, they say it's very depressing. So I, I don't know uh, about that. Um, what uh, I want to talk about is human-made climate change. There are two enormous uh, moral issues here, which are really uh, unprecedented. Uh, the, the, the one, of course, is that the people who are causing climate change are only a fraction of the people on the planet. There, there are literally billions of people who will feel the effects and in many cases, the largest effects, but they have done uh, little or nothing to cause the problem. That's one of the moral issues. The other one, which is the one that has really grabbed me the last, um, this last decade, is the intergenerational injustice that is involved in this uh, climate change problem because the current generation is burning most of the fossil fuels and enjoying the benefits of that energy, but because of the nature of the climate system with its inertia, the largest effects will be felt, be felt by uh, young people um, and future generations, and that is um, another moral issue. Um, and it is uh, related to the fact that the climate, uh, because it has only partially responded to the gases that we've already put in the atmosphere, there's the danger that we can push the system beyond tipping points. And you've heard about this already um, uh, earlier, uh, about the uh, dangers that the ice sheets can begin to disintegrate and um, cause future sea level change, which is out of the control of uh, young people and future generations. And also, as we begin to put pressure on different species and, and drive some of them to extinction, uh, because of the interdependencies among these species, we can end up uh, causing much larger changes in the future and, and driving a significant fraction of the species on the planet uh, to extinction. So. And it's not just, I'm particularly concerned about those two issues because those are irreversible effects on any time scale that we can imagine. We're not going to regrow the ice sheets and we're not going to uh, evolve new species in any generation of humans that we can imagine. Uh, but there are other things that are already uh, occurring around the planet, including the melting of the Arctic sea ice, the melting on the glaciers, uh, on the ice sheets, uh, which is uh, causing effects such as the increase in the discharge of these giant icebergs to the ocean. And we know that the effect of this increased melting is causing the ice sheets to begin to discharge mass at a substantial rate. We have these very precise measurements from a gravity satellite which shows that the mass of the Greenland ice sheet and also the Antarctic ice sheet is uh, beginning to be substantial at a rate of a couple of hundred cubic kilometers um, per year. And the, the uh, worrisome thing is the possibility that uh, this rate at which mass is being lost is actually increasing. And what we're afraid of is that it will really uh, begin to fall off a cliff there and we will get a larger sea level rise uh, this, um, this century than uh, has been uh, talked about by uh, very conservative uh, scientific estimates. And um, you know, the last time, you talk about these, you, you heard earlier today about the idea of two degrees warming or four degrees warming and some people thinking we've already uh, committed to such large warmings. 
Well, the last time the planet was two degrees Celsius warmer, sea level was 25 meters higher. And the last time it was four degrees warmer, there was no ice, no ice sheets on the planet, and sea level was about 75 meters higher. Well, even uh, a sea level rise of several meters would put uh, a couple of hundred million people uh, in, in China below sea level. So obviously this is something that we don't want to see happen. Um, and we, we, we've, we've heard already about the effects uh, that are already occurring, the stresses on the coral reefs where between a quarter and a third of the species in the ocean uh, reside in, in conjunction with these coral reefs, which are uh, justifiably called the rainforests of the ocean. And we also see already that climate zones are shifting, and that's having um, an effect in places like the southern United States, in the Mediterranean region, Australia. There are significant climate effects already occurring, and that leads to effects such as the increase in, in fires and the fact that these fires are burning hotter so th that it's much more difficult for the forest to recover. It, they burn so hot that the seeds the, on the ground burn and, and the forest uh, cannot recover. Um, now, what has uh, changed, to, to talk a little bit about this, uh, the moral uh, issue of uh, who has caused the climate change and, and who's suffering the consequences. Well, China has recently passed the United States in the current emissions. Uh, this is the 2009 emissions, and so China is now emitting more than the United States. But the climate change is not caused by the current emissions. It is a proportional to the integrated emissions over time. Because although the carbon that was released uh, a century ago by burning coal 100 years ago, that carbon has been, a larger portion of it has been taken up by the ocean and biosphere, but that CO2 was also in the atmosphere a longer period of time. And those two uh, factors essentially cancel out. So you can estimate the responsibility for climate change from the integrated emissions. And the U.S. is responsible for 27% of those, or about three times more than China, which is the second most responsible. So if you look at this on a per capita basis, then it's not just the United States. Uh, the United States is about 10 times more responsible on a per capita basis than China, or about 25 times more responsible than India. But other countries like uh, Germany and the United Kingdom and Canada and Australia, which is not on here, are very similar uh, to the United States. Um, so that, that relates to this, uh, the one moral issue. The other one, this uh, question of intergenerational responsibilities didn't uh, begin to have an effect on me until the last several years. I, after I testified to Congress in the 1980s, I and, and uh, got all the reactions to that, I decided that it, that really was not what I wanted to spend uh, my time doing. And I decided to stay out of the um, public arena on this um, issue and stick to doing science, which is what I think I can do reasonably well. And I'm not a, uh, a speaker, I'm not a communicator. So for 15 years after my testimony in the late 1980s, I, when I received requests from the media, especially television stations, I would refer them to scientists who are much better communicators and who enjoy the, the process, namely my friends uh, Steve Schneider and Michael Oppenheimer. Uh, but uh, by the middle, I, I had my first grandchild in uh, uh, year 
about a decade ago. Sophie's actually now 12 years old. Um, and um, by the middle of this decade, I began to feel, I, I realized there was this big gap between what, what had become clear scientifically and what was understood by the people who need to, to know, and that's the public. And um, I decided that I didn't want my grandchildren to say that Opa understood what was happening, but he didn't try to make it clear. So I decided I was going to give one public talk, and I spent about six months preparing for this talk. Um, and I wanted to back it up with some published papers. And um, I, I, I gave a talk uh, in, um, but, uh, let me first comment on this chart. Uh, so this just summarizes the fact that most people, mo I think all cultures in the world really uh, feel an obligation to future generations. Parents all, ar all around the world are willing to sacrifice for their children. They would not knowingly take actions that are very harmful to their children. Uh, the problem is not, it's not the, the parents. The problem is they don't recognize the situation, and the governments are not living up to their responsibility. I mean, we, we form governments for the sake of, of uh, serving the people, uh, not uh, fossil fuel interests. But um, they're not doing a good job of that. Anyway, when I gave this talk, <laughs> this was one of the charts that I used in my uh, talk about five years ago, in which I was trying to make clear that the physics that we're talking about is very simple. By adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere, we reduce the thermal radiation to space, and we're causing the planet to be out of energy balance. But we're not sure exactly how far it is out of balance, because in addition to greenhouse gases, which are measured very accurately, there are also these particles that we add to the atmosphere. And those uh, particles reflect sunlight. So that has a cooling effect. So although the greenhouse gases cause a forcing of three watts per meter squared, it's equivalent to having three of these tiny one watt Christmas tree bulbs over every square meter of the Earth's surface. But then there's this reduction uh, by the, the cooling effect of the aerosols. So the net forcing is, Sophie was trying to say it's about two watts, but Connor could only count one watt. And the truth is we don't know. It's something in that range. Um, but we're now uh, getting a better handle on that because we know where that energy has to go. The atmosphere has a very small heat capacity. Uh, the conductivity of the ground is very low, so only the upper few tens of meters change temperature as the planet gets warmer. 